Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Glory be to God. Go ahead and just get over to the book of Colossians. We'll read, uh, we'll, we'll read uh, passages or parts and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them and then we'll, we'll move along. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everybody love Jesus? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God as we, we keep moving along here. Paul is in his second imprisonment. Here we are uh, continuing to read and uh, the letters he wrote here in this imprisonment. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Real quickly here, now one of the things that Paul's dealing with in this letter is Gnosticism. Gnostics have entered in, uh, disclaiming the uh, deity of Christ. The, Paul does not use the word Jesus in this entire epistle without putting Christ behind it to declare his deity throughout this letter, all right? Because one of, the, one of the main things he has to deal with is the Gnostic teaching, and you know that was that Jesus wasn't, you know, real, uh, or God, he wasn't God. Uh, one of the other uh, aspects of Gnosticism, he didn't, act, he didn't actually come in the flesh. There's all kinds of stuff they taught, but they, they, the main thing is they deny the deity of Christ, okay? So Paul begins with his opening letter here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, that's his... Uh, son Timothy in the, in the Lord, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ and to all who are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, saints here is really more of a reference to the faithful brethren than it is that they're, they're the holy set apart ones. Just a phraseology. He says that we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I like Paul was praying for them and he didn't pray stupid stuff. Paul didn't pray, oh, God, help me if you can. And, you know, oh, Lord, you know, whatever your will is, you know, work it out in their life. No, um, he said, we pray always for you since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all saints. Praise God. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth Fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. And uh, as you have learned of Epaphras, Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is also a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now, one of the things here we'll have to talk about is Paul did not know the Colossians. He had not met them face to face. Um, so he is, and now Ep Epaphras was a uh, possibly a student of his when he was in, F in F F Ephesus and in Paul's school there where Paul taught for two years. He was probably one of his students and then went and started a church over here. So he's declaring, you know, Paul's uh, position and so forth. Um, notice what happened. He prayed for them because he heard of their faith in the Christ Jesus, the love which they have to all the saints, the hope which is laid up for them in heaven. Now, you know, understand this. You know, we have a hope. Everybody say we have a hope. We, you know, we're not walking in the fullness of everything we're supposed to walk in. Now, one of the things that we got, we, we kind of got over, and, and this is what happens when you only teach an aspect of, of truth. We got over into back in the charismatic teaching revival of the 70s and 80s. We got, and we got teaching on righteousness and our position in Christ. And we got so much teaching on our position in Christ, we left out the fact we're still walking in the flesh. There are hopes that we have that you're not walking in yet. The hope of the resurrection. You're not walking in it yet. Not of your physical body. Hello? So there, there's still, we still have things that are our hope. The, the blessed hope is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to catch away the church. Amen? And so there, 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 we still have a hope in him, praise God, which is laid up for us in heaven. You, know, you can't have it here. Now, there was a teaching that came out around the late 50s on the tail end of what was referred to as the latter rain move. Latter rain was the, um, uh, one of the primary uh, things that came out of that was a restoration of the ministry gifts to the church. Before then, in, in, uh, for a number of uh, centuries or decades, we only recognized um, pastors and evangelists. Teacher was usually a Bible school teacher. They didn't, apostles were done away with. Prophets were done away with. Teachers, they kind of thought of them as Sunday school teachers. Only two gifts. If you were in a, a mainline denomination, God ordained, you were either a pastor or an evangelist. 
Well, in the latter rain, there was a restoration of all the ministry gifts to the body of Christ. But on the tail end of that, a teaching came out that uh, years later, uh, people started referring to, you know, more or so, manifested sons of God. Now, if you want to know what, what uh, the manifested sons of God was, that we're going to be so, we're, we're going to get to a certain place in enlightenment that we're going to become manifestedly the sons of God here on the earth. We're going to have a glorified body like Jesus. And, and all the ones who don't walk in that are going to have to go away on the mothership. Because the rapture is going to take them away while the manifested sons of God rule and reign. Now, that, that teaching got rehashed in the 70s under something called Kingdom Now. Some of y'all may have heard of Kingdom Now teaching. It was nothing but manifest the sons of God rehashed under a different title. People, all the, all the uh, evangelicals started wearing the clerical collars, and they started, you know, and they, they were all under uh, a guy out of Atlanta. I don't, you know, no need to cut talking about his name, but the fact is, you know, his teaching was, was nothing but manifest the sons of God. Now, there are things that we're not going to walk in until we go to heaven. You will not get your glorified body until the rapture of the church takes place when Jesus, even, even, even those who go before you won't get it until the rapture of the church takes place. They which, which are dead, they'll, they'll be, we won't prevent them which are, are dead. They'll, they'll rise first. They'll get their glorified bodies, all right? So we have a blessed hope in heaven. Isn't that good? Whereof you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. What did Paul write to the church at Ephesus? We are sealed with the spirit of promise until, that day, until, until the day of the purchased possession. Praise God. <clears throat> which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. Now notice that he's saying here that he's heard of them, their faith, he's heard of their love, they have the hope in their heart from the gospel, and it bears fruit. Walking with Jesus Christ should bear fruit in your life. The people who teach that you can stay the same, and it's, it's all fine, God doesn't care, that is a Gnostic belief. Because what you do in the flesh doesn't matter because it's all spiritual anyway. So you hear some of this extreme grace teaching, and they're teaching Gnosticism. It doesn't matter what you do in the body. And the Bible says to glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God's. That's what it says. So it does matter what you do. You're supposed to glorify God with your body. Not It doesn't matter what you do. And Paul says here um, that... Um, we're to bring forth fruit, and as it does also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of, the, of God in truth. Grace, I, just, I love understanding that grace, grace strengthens. Grace empowers me to do what I could not do without God's grace. It doesn't allow me to continue doing what I'm doing. It empowers me to do what I could not do. Completely different concept. See, there are those who want to teach us that it doesn't matter what you do because you're in the grace, when really the grace of God came not, as we said before, um, uh, last week or the week before, when we were talking about that Jesus came not in the world to condemn the world, but through him that all men might have life. In other words, he didn't come to damn men to stay in the same state. He came to deliver them from that state. What was that state? A state that, that rebelled against God. A state that was uh, anti-God. It was against God. It operated under the spirit, the, the spirit of the sons of disobedience. That spirit's in the world. And it was operating in us. God, Jesus came to deliver us from that power. Why? So we could walk as sons of obedience. Amen. Thank God for his grace because we cannot do it in our power. But his grace empowers us to walk as sons of obedience. Which means what? I make my body a living sacrifice. Amen? Now don't turn the air conditioner back on. I turn it back thinking people are going to get cold. But the lights got turned on and it got hot. Turn those TV lights on, baby. It gets warm in a hurry. Hallelujah. As you also learn of Epaphras, Epaphras our dear fellow servant, or bond servant, or slave, you know, bond, love slave, a bond slave, who is for you a faithful, in other words, he made himself a slave because of his love for, to the gospel, to the work of God. Who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. So that, you know, love in the spirit. Uh, you know, Paul had received from Epaphras, the E dude, E, Epaphras, Epaphras. He had received a message, Paul had received from him, that they loved him in the spirit. They had never met him, but they loved him in the spirit. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the 
um, with the knowledge of, of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul wanted them to be filled up. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? The, the word fill here is the idea of filling to completeness. Okay? He wants to be filled to completeness. He wanted them, listen, of knowledge. This word knowledge is epinosis. And that word epinosis, you know, can be, it can be uh, translated kind of as a clear, precise, accurate, thorough, experiential knowledge. Or even this, an ever-increasing knowledge. The more we walk with the Lord, the more we should know about the Lord and know the Lord. Amen. Our epinosis can be a clear, price, clear concise, precise, accurate knowledge of God and also one that continues to grow. Wherever you are, we ought to have a, a clear and precise and accurate knowledge of God at whatever level we are, at the stage we are, but then it should continue to grow. As more we know the Lord, the more that knowledge should grow. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, Paul had described this as a, you know, a, a thorough knowledge. It involved a deep and accurate and comprehensive acquaintance with the way God expressed himself in the Bible. When we have the knowledge of God, we are acquainted with how God does things. Now, folks, people who say some of the things they say in the body of Christ today cannot have a complete and accurate acquaintance with God and say them. They can't. Why? Because God doesn't do it that way. That's not how God works. God does not work in making it okay for you to sin. That's not, that's, not even, that's not even how his love works. When you're acquainted with God, you know this, we talked about this the other week, loving <clears throat> Jesus, love righteousness, and hated iniquity. If you know God's ways, then you know he hates iniquity. You're acquainted with him, you know how he feels about iniquity. Man, you've been married to your wife, you know what she doesn't like. I know what my wife doesn't like. <clears throat> She does not like me to drive the Dodge Grand Caravan like a Fiat 124 sports spider. I still do sometime, but I am well acquainted with the fact that she doesn't like it. Okay? And, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll see her sometime. I'll be doing something. And she'll start grabbing this. Oh, okay, I, got, I slowed down. Oh, yeah, that's right. She hates the way I drive it when I'm driving it like a sports car, you know? I'm wanting to pop it down in the third in the curve, rev it up to about 4,000 RPMs, and pop it on back into the curve, coming out of there and just shoot it right. Well, you can't do that with a minivan. Probably don't want to anyway. Okay? I'm well acquainted with my wife that she doesn't like, uh, you know. Uh, now, my wife doesn't give a rip about surround sound. She'd rather have a little bitty speaker about this big you know, and, and watch it on a two-inch TV. I'm acquainted with my, I know my wife's likes and dislikes. And as a husband, you know, they're, you know, we don't live in this bondage that I can't do everything the way she wants it. But, you know, she doesn't care if we go to the bonus room on the 55 inch with the surround sound. As a matter of fact, she'd prefer to just sit somewhere and watch it on a 32 inch with the television speakers that sound terrible and, and, and you know, thin and, you know, had that thin sound to them. She didn't care about the sound coming from behind you or whatever, you know. You know cause she, she, what was that? It was the surround sound, baby. Um, but I'm acquainted with her. I have a knowledge of what she likes and doesn't like. Okay? And I endeavor not to do things that disturb her about that. All right? Okay. You know, me and one of the first things you learn in life is leave the, to put the toilet lid back down. You're supposed to have learned that by now. <laughs> did you punch him? Rules when I make statements like that are women. You cannot poke, prod, or, or, or elbow. That's against the rules. You know that, Jesse. I've taught that for years. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we, when, we know, when we come acquainted with God, when we come into that epinosis of God, we come, become acquainted with how God expresses himself, then we know what God likes and doesn't like. And how can we say we love God and then sit around and do things we know he doesn't like or he hates? See? And that Paul's praying for them, you become filled. Filled to completeness with that acquaintance. That, that, that knowledge of acquaintance with God, how he does things and how he expresses himself. 
Everybody say glory to God. That you might walk worthy. Oh, that, that goes over real big. Hallelujah. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto due pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to the glorious power, and all patience, and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints. Now, the second uh, petition is, in, is a consequence of the first, and those being filled with the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is not imputed to an end to itself, but is given to enable believers to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. To walk worthy of the Lord means in general to live a life commiserate with what the Lord has done for a person. Now listen to this. This, this is very good. This is from the Complete Biblical Library. Uh, published by World Library Press. No longer in print. You can get it electronic, but no longer in print. Doctrine and ethics were inseparable to Paul. Right knowledge should lead to right behavior. Anybody that says otherwise is lying to you. The Greek word translated worthy, axios, A-X-I-O-S, often was used in conjunction with a pair of scales in which the item on one side should weigh as much as the item on the other side. So Paul said that you should walk in balance of what the Lord's done for you. God's grace should be in balance with the behavior you have in life. The scale should be in balance. The grace empowers you to walk it, and so it comes into balance. When people are teaching, it's all about the grace, and I don't, and I don't have to do anything. I don't have to behave right. I don't have to live right. The scales go out of balance. The grace side becomes weighted, but that's not what the Word says. It said that you should walk in a balance as to what the Lord's done for you. And what has the Lord done for you? He's imparted grace to you. So your behavior, your right behavior, should be in line with the knowledge you have of what he's done for you. So when people come along and start teaching, it's all the grace, it's all the grace, it's all the grace, it's all the grace. You don't have to do anything. What have they done? They have taken the, the weights on the side of behavior off and the scales go out of balance. And so what are you? You are now spiritually imbalanced. And you're not walking in a balance with the Lord. You're supposed to. So, do you walk worthy means that we are to live a life commiserate with the Lord. What he's done for you, doctrine and ethics, we're always, always inseparable. Right knowledge should lead to right behavior. Man, when you learn that the Lord has empowered you to live right, that's how you should live. You should not run off and go, Woo, God made grace all, that's all about grace. You know, it's all about that grace, about that grace, you know. No effort is all about that grace, about that grace. No effort. We're all saying about all about that grace. When the Bible says that the grace, when the Bible is teaching us that the grace of God has now empowered us to live right before the Lord. So we, wait, we get into what? Axios. We get into balance with God. Our behavior is now governed by the knowledge of what he's done for us. And we live a life that now brings everything into balance. Amen. Paul did not write and say, I write into you and say, don't do a doggone thing because grace did it all. No. Walk worthy. Walk in axios. Walk in the balance of the knowledge that you have. Yes, God has sent Jesus. The great by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. We're living under the, the, the favor of God. We're living under the empowerment of God. We're living under the charis of God. Thank God for it. Because we could not do the right behavior without the grace of God. This is, now, this is where I differentiate with a lot of people who teach, on, teach some of the stupid stuff on grace. I believe the grace of God is, is one of the most beautiful and powerful subjects of the New Testament, if not the most powerful. But I do not see it as I have no longer have any responsibility to do anything. I don't see it that I can use it as, as, as uh, lasciviousness. I don't see it as an excuse to the flesh. I understand that the grace of God took and put me and placed me in a position and empowers me to do what God has always commanded man to do 
but brought me to a place through Jesus Christ where I could not do it by the power of the flesh. Brought me to a place now his grace empowers me through the knowledge of that grace to walk and to live and to, com and, and to and have my lifestyle walk in harmony with the revelation of the grace to bring my spiritual life into axios, into balance. Praise God. <clears throat> my going to church is not an act to get me into heaven. But because I love God, he tells me not to forsake the assembling of the cells of, 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 of believers, as is the manner of some. I come not to do a religious duty, but I come out of the fact that his grace has now set me free to be able to come and worship with brothers and sisters in Christ and live the life according to, and do what his word says. He said, don't, don't forsake it. I don't forsake it. I keep my life in balance with what his grace has empowered me to do. I don't not sin because I don't want to go to hell. I don't sin because his grace has come to deliver me from the power of sin. Jesus Christ came to set me free from sin. And now I'm going to live my life in a balance with what he did for me. My knowledge of the power of God. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How is he that is dead to sin live any longer therein? Therefore, when I come and, and, and sin and face sin, I can say God's grace has empowered me to live above this. Now I can have because of my knowledge that Jesus Christ through his grace delivered me from the power of sin. I can now live the behavior that the word of God's always commanded me to live because of the empowerment of his grace and my life comes into axios it comes into balance my behavior matches his gift amen well that's that's not works no 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 no, no. it takes his grace to empower me to be able to do that because before i couldn't do it and before you couldn't do it because we, we were all guilty at some point of at least one point of the law. No matter what it was, we became guilty of one point of the law. Therefore, we were guilty of the whole law. If it wasn't murder, maybe you were just a glutton. Maybe you were a dog pig or something. I mean, you know, whatever. We could not fulfill the entire law. His grace now empowers me through my relationship with Jesus Christ to live an empowered life, to keep my life in balance. And if I sin, there, if any man sin, we are... We have an advocate with the Father who's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, down through 1 John chapter 2, the first two verses. Okay? I have an advocate. I confess. I have an advocate. I'm cleansed. And I keep my life in that balance. So axios is, key, is, is the right knowledge leads to right behavior. Now, I can tell you, you can go tell people all day long, all day long, all day long that they're under grace. It doesn't matter what to do. God's going to love them. And you're going to think that's going to get them free of a sin consciousness. Hogwash. Why? Because they're going to go out and sin. And you told them it was okay to sin. And the Bible says, if our heart condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. Their own heart will condemn them for living in sin. And then some bozo will come along and try to teach them that it's okay and that they're just, they got a, right, they got a sin consciousness because they're condemned about sinning. Some of these students who go to Bible school and say all this stupid stuff because they think they got some revelation. Hello? No. Your heart will condemn you. So what right knowledge leads me out of the condemnation of the heart. How? Because I found out I've been liberated through Jesus Christ. Liberated from what? See, this is the mess. This is when we get messed up. I, I'm, I'm hung up here. It's okay. We're in verse 10 of chapter 1. Glory to God. This one word is a whole sermon. Amen? <clears throat> when you were... What, 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 what does the Bible say? It says, Use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Why? Because the flesh will bring you into captivity. See, and when people teach that it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh, that's just Gnosticism. That was part of the Gnostic teaching. Okay? Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, not to use your liberty, your, your, your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. The Gnostics taught, it's because we, we were really only spirit, that the flesh wasn't really the real realm. It didn't matter what you did with it. Now, there's a lot of teaching under some of the, quote, radical grace teaching. It's not really radical grace. It's, 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 it's licentiousness teaching. They turned the grace of God into licentiousness and lasciviousness. Okay? 
But the teaching that it doesn't matter what you do with your body is Gnosticism. It does matter what you do with your body. Paul wrote and said, don't use your uh, liberty. What liberty? The liberty we have found in Christ as an occasion to the flesh. Well, you're free from the law. But you're not free. What do you mean free from the law? I, in other words, the law is no longer the means by which I, I come into relationship with God. Now, can I say something? The law is still the moral code of God. God doesn't believe in, in lesbianism, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, bestiality. He doesn't believe in stealing. He doesn't believe in robbing. He doesn't believe in lying. He doesn't believe in taking your neighbor's wife. He doesn't believe in any of that stuff. Still don't. But the law was given just to make sin, make it very clear what sin was. Sin is sin. And listed a whole bunch of stuff that's sin. And then even stuff that's not even in here, sin. And Paul wrote and said in Galatians, he said, the works of the flesh are. And really the Greek kind of bears out, kind, kind of like, these are some of them, it's not all of them. Like this. And so we come into the church and we, we start preaching, we're free in Christ, we've been liberated, glory to God. And they take words and phraseology that Paul was using as a relationship to coming to God through the obedience to the law. We're free from that and use it as a cloak of freedom of the flesh. And the truth is, it can't be any further from that. The liberty to which Paul made reference to was we are free from the constraints of the, of the law to come to God. And we now come by faith. And we come by faith in a relationship with God through the grace of God. In other words, it is impossible. It was given as a schoolmaster. Remember, the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us what? To Christ. It was not given so that when the law was broken, you, you go live and do anything you want to do. And there are people who teach that. Now, they teach it slick. If Brother Bill calls it greasy gracers. They're slick. One guy, one, that movie, that, remember, remember the preacher's wife, Whitney Houston and, and Denzel Washington? She said, that man smiles so old you could fry chicken on it. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, and so we began to take this teaching and take liberty and turn liberty into something that the Bible does not teach. Our liberty is in this. You can never come to God through the law. So I am free from the demand to become a righteous being through obedience to the law. I have been liberated to come to, uh, to come to God and become a righteous being through the grace of God who sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Through that grace, I can now become righteous through the act of faith and believing in what he did for me. I am not liberated to do whatever stinking thing my flesh wants to do and say I'm under grace. That's a fallacy. No, I've been liberated from obeying the law to obeying the law of faith, and I now come and believe in what Jesus did, and now my knowledge that he has made me free from sin, he has broken the authority of sin over my life, he has set me free by his power, glory to God, he bore my sin, he was made sin because for, for me who, would, who knew no, I mean, he, knew, he was made sin who knew no sin that I might come into right standing and my right standing is demonstrated by how I live. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am liberated. But Paul said, do not use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Meaning that we are not liberated to do whatever we want to do. What am I to do? I am to study the word of God. And when I see in the Bible, it says, you know, that, you know, uh, let him that stole steal no more. New Testament. People say it's Old Testament. Oh, it's Old Testament. It doesn't matter if it's Old Testament. It's still God's law. In other words, God hates stealing, whether it's Old or New Testament. He hates adultery, Old or New Testament. As a matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus took it up a level higher than they had in the Old Testament. Man, if they, if they, if they had to live under Jesus' teaching on adultery, they wouldn't, I don't know if there would be anybody left to, to get Jesus here. He that looks on a woman to lust after has committed adultery in his heart already. Wow. 
So fuck your eyeballs out. That's what he said. If you're high offended, fuck it out. He took it up a level. God did not come to make sin more palatable or easier. He did not send Jesus so that sin could be uh, engaged in and covered over. He came to liberate us from the dominion of sin so that the grace of God could empower us to live right. And so my knowledge of that, what Paul said, because Paul rhetorically, he, he did these things. He talked about how we were free from sin, yada, yada. Then he comes back and says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So he comes back and says, listen, the knowledge I'm giving you is not so you can continue in sin, <clears throat> but that right behavior can come out of this knowledge. The axios. We come into perfect balance. Or we come into balance. Not perfect balance. You'll never be perfect here. But you get what I'm saying. We come into balance. How many of you have ever used the old balance scales? You had the little milligrams and the five milligrams and the, and the little things, you, and you put them on there, and you, you, know, you put something over here, and you had to go ding, ding, ding. Put something too big on there, and you go ding. No. Pull that off and go to a lower, a smaller one, and, and go in smaller increments. Do what? A metric system. And you keep doing it until, and, until the... And then now, it's an imbalance. The truth... Of the, of the weights, they're, me, they're measured, reveals how much the other weighs. The knowledge of God reveals how to live his way. And that's why people get mad when we start saying some of the things we say. But you, you've got to stop looking for reasons to stay out of balance. Paul wrote and said... Because, listen, why is he saying this? Because one of the, like I said earlier, one of the main teachers of Gnosticism, and that's what he deals with a lot in this letter, was that what you do with your body doesn't matter. That's one of the, that was one of the, one of the, first, the main teachers of Gnosticism was Jesus didn't, wasn't God. That's the primary. The second was, what, because everything spiritual, natural doesn't matter, the real world is spiritual, the natural doesn't matter what you do with it. Because it's going to be burned up anyway. So it just didn't matter what you did. And Paul says, wait a second now. I'm telling you to walk worthy of the Lord. I'm telling you to have a balance in life where the knowledge you gain of who God is and what God's done for you through Jesus Christ and the grace that's been imparted to you, that you, your behavior comes into balance with what you know. And what was that knowledge? It was that clear, precise, acquainted knowledge of God. You came into a an acquaintance, remember the previous verse, verse 9, the word epinosis, it's, it, it's in a reference to you're acquainted with the ways of God. We sing that song from Hill Songs. Show me your ways that I might walk with you. Show me your way. What are we saying? Lord, bring us into epinosis. Bring us into epinosis so that from that knowledge springs forth the ability to walk the way, the ways of God. And by an axiosis, axios, we come into harmony. We come into balance. Well, what happens when we get out of balance? Then we need to get back into balance. Hello? When you know you're supposed to walk in love and you're not walking in love, you're out of balance. Come on. And when, what happens when you get out of balance? Well, how, how many know that when your car tires get out of balance, what happens? Get the left front tire out of balance with the, all the other tires, and what's going to happen is you're riding down the road. And you pull the car into the place, say, look, I think my tire's out of balance. They put it on the thing, they take them all off, they put it on the, on the, on the spinning doohickey, and they put the little weights, they put those weights on them. To get, maybe it fell off, broke off on something while you're riding down the road. And it'll, get, it'll make your car bounce. Because it's not spinning in the same harmony with the other tires. And so you take it in there and they, they check the pressure, they check the balance of all of them, they put the little weights on them, put them back on your car, and you drive off and it's going, mm. It's good to have your tires in balance. It's good to have your life in balance. 
So when you know from, a, from a being acquainted with God that God demands walking in love. Now, I'm not talking about this crazy lunatic stuff. I'm talking about biblical walking in love. All right? I'm not talking about we love, we, we, our love people lets them do whatever they want to do. That's not love. Remember, Jesus pleased God, and he loved righteousness, but he hated iniquity. So love does not love iniquity. Okay? His scepter was a scepter of righteousness. And righteousness doesn't just mean being in right relationship with. It means living and walking in that relationship. Just like we're talking about right here. It's really what we're talking about right here. So as we come, become acquainted with God. So when we, we've heard the love messages. When we see the Bible says that we're walking love, then what do we do? Your life will get out of balance if you refuse to walk in love with people. Hello? You cannot justify hating your pastor. Well, I left. Well, but you still didn't deal with the fact you weren't walking in love with them. Just because you leave doesn't fix the fact you weren't walking in love. Hello? That would ever be. Your life will get out of balance. But if the grass was greener at the other church and everything's hunking. No, it's not. Down on the inside, you're messed up. You're out of balance. How many of you ever had a, anybody had, ever had a swimming pool or had a family member that had a swimming pool? What's one of the things they go out and do every morning if it's being used a lot? Well, after they sweep it. They put the little test thing in there. They pull it up and drop the little chemicals in to see what? If the pH is in balance. Why? Because if it's out of balance, the water will either start growing uh, things or it'll, be, it'll get cloudy. All kinds of things will happen to it. Uh, it'll burn the daylight out of your eyes or it'll get this cloudy look in the water. There's all kinds of things that happens when it gets out of balance one way or the other. The pH is too high, the pH is too low. And what do you got to do? You got to put chemical in there to bring it back into balance so the water's crystal clear. Amen? Uh, my dad, he had one um, at the last house they had, he had kind of a um, swim pool. About 10 foot long, you know, 10 foot wide, 15 foot long. Had a swim jet at one end, that kind of thing. And he decided after, after having an above the ground pool at our previous house that he was going to put in the little electrodes. They're beautiful because they, they go in and they, they, they shoot electrons into the water and it, it, it keeps the water in balance through these little nodes. Now you still got to test it because if it gets out of balance, you might have to shock a little bit to get it to rebalance and then, then those will keep back up with it. You know, if the electrodes go bad, they have to put new ones in. But that would actually keep the pool balanced. Oh, it was really cool. Because it went through the pump, and when it came out the end of the pump, those little electrodes went and, and hit the, the particles in there and charged it and changed and, and set the balance. Hallelujah. So you didn't have to use chlorine hardly ever. So it didn't burn your eyes and all that kind of stuff. It was really neat. Okay? God wants your life in balance. Amen? So when you're, if you're maintaining the pool, you know one thing. If it gets out of balance, it's going to be a mess. We don't want our life out of balance. We want to live in a way that as we know more about God, we now change, I hate to use this word, but our behavior is evolving in relationship to our knowledge, our acquaintance with the ways of God. And the more about him we know, the more our behavior morphs or evolves or changes. Or let's use, let's use the Greek word, it metamorphoses. We have a metamorphosis. And we, we go from flesh rule creatures to spirit rule creatures. And we are governing our actions because of our spirit's communion with the Father and the knowledge of the Father and our acquaintance with the Father. We now, now govern our actions by that knowledge. And our actions change to measure. And we come into balance. Hallelujah. Instead of you know, smoke your stogie, drink your, your designer beer, drink wines from all over the world, do whatever you want to do, and then call and say, I'm under grace. You can't say anything to me. You're being judgmental. Well, go ahead, stupid. Live out of balance. I said, live out of balance. Because in the end, it's going to cost you. It won't cost me. I'm not going to pay the price for you living out of balance. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to wash up ministry-wise because you're out of balance. I'm not going to fail with my walk with God because you're out of balance. You're going to pay the price. Now I'm under grace. Honey, I'm telling you, you will. The Bible, we will be judged for what we do in the flesh. 
whether good or evil. So what I want to do, I want to teach people that if you'll get acquainted with God through that, to be filled, as Paul said in verse 9, to be filled, to be filled with completeness in your epinosis of how God does things, because of that, that right knowledge is going to bring me to the place where I have the axios, the walking worthy, I come into balance. And now my behavior rep is representative of that acquaintance, acquaintance with how God does things. And what's going to happen? Because my life is in balance and I'm doing these things this way, I'm not going to face bad consequences for fornicating and saying I was under grace. I'm not going to face consequences for stealing and claiming I'm under grace. What am I going to I'm going to face blessing because I walked, my behavior was representative of the knowledge and wisdom I had of my acquaintance with God's ways. Glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. And at the end of the day, I, can, I don't have to be thinking about stuff. I might be sitting there going, well, my heart's condemning me, but, but preacher so-and-so said I'm under grace. And that sin consciousness to be condemned about, you know, I went out with three girls today and had sex with them this afternoon. And for me to feel bad about that, that's sin consciousness. No, stupid. That's your spirit telling you you're out of balance. You're not walking in the epinosis, the acquaintance of the ways of God. It's because God said not to fornicate. Boom. Boom. You can kind of get that, that, that in-your-face stuff the kids do now. Boom. Hello. Anybody blessed? Did y'all enjoy this? Well, we're done. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.